And now we move on to our next speaker, who's very familiar to the Oli Foundation, Dr. Alan Bookman. Um, a special note that more extensive bios appear online, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight the important ones, one which Dr. Bookman forgot to mention. Uh, Dr. Bookman, you avoided the, the concept of serving six years on the Oli board. I would like to see you that <laughs> in your bio, please. Uh, Dr. Bookman is professor of clinical surgery, University of Illinois, UI Health. Um, well, <laughs> That's it. Short and sweet for Dr. Bookman here. <laughs> and his presentation is focused on the consequences of noncompliance, which uh, not including the OLE board participation is not complying with only regulations. So the consequences of non-compliant compliance and the importance of being compliant. So let's keep that in mind, Dr. Bookman. All right. Well, thanks very much, Joan. Um, hopefully we won't have an internet uh, problem here because uh, I had trouble hearing Joan. Uh, and so I didn't hear the part about um, that. I didn't put it on my CV about being on the, the only board. So uh, hopefully it's not on my end. Um, so um, uh, I was asked to talk about consequences of noncompliance and, and, and compliance. And it's actually something that um, I've never lectured on, uh, but actually I have. I've lectured patients on it, uh, but I've never given a formal lecture on this. So I, I just prepared a few slides. I sort of thought about it and what are the kind of the issues here? Uh, and 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 if I was a patient, what would be, you know, my concerns, and and what are my issues with, uh, with uh, compliance? Um, and um, I, I'm going to talk about those, but I want to leave plenty of room for, uh, for discussion uh, and questions because I think that's really going to be the, the 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 main part of this. So, um, if I could have the next, the, the first slide, please. I I just don't have them on my laptop. Uh, One moment, Dr. Buckman. Now, this slide is all blurred. Um, is that how everybody else sees it? Uh, Lisa, can you comment on that? It looks fine on my screen. Oh, okay. Now it, it just fine on mine too. Okay, now it just uh, it just straightened out. It said the uh, the internet connection is unstable. Okay, well, hopefully, Thanks, hopefully this will uh, this will work here. Okay, so let me have the let me have the next slide. Okay, so um, it, there we go. So when we talk about compliance, the first thing that we have to talk about is what exactly is compliance? And I actually looked up the definition and the definition was a little bit different than what I uh, expected. It, it was the ability to act according to an order, a set of rules or a request. So it's not actually defined as something that, um, that you do voluntarily. It's actually something that you can be ordered to do either through a direct order or a set of rules or you're requested to do, which is interesting because I always sort of looked at compliance as something that, uh, that you naturally did uh, or, or not. So in the future, I'll start requesting uh, all of my patients to be compliant uh, in order to fit the definition. Next slide, please. Next, I, I wanted to look up what other words actually could be used to describe compliance. And there's actually quite a number of these. Uh, agreement, obviously, if you're requested to be compliant and to take your medications or to do your uh, parental nutrition or to clean your catheter the way that you were taught um, or, or to uh, infuse the, the full amount of parental nutrition or to infuse it every day, like uh, instead of uh, skipping some days. Um, 
excuse me if I look uh, to uh, to my right because oh there we go because the, the internet connection is not good uh, and uh, and now I can actually see the slides and see the words but I ha I have it up on another screen just in case uh, I can't see them but you can concession is kind of an important uh, an interesting word because it suggests that one wasn't really compliant but they've made some kind of deal. Uh, with their uh, provider and in order to be compliant. Uh, obedience, that, that's interesting too, because that again suggests that you're following an order and surrender. Well, that's actually going a little past even concession. It suggests maybe you didn't even want to be compliant uh, and the provider said, well, if you're not, then we're not going to take care of you anymore. Yielding is kind of similar, consent. Well, sometimes we actually do have patients sign a consent uh, that they will uh, agree to, uh, to, to do the things that we ask them to do. Uh, accommodating, this is a little bit different as well. Well, compliance sort of interferes with uh, the things that you want to do in your life. Well, that's that's true. If you got to take a medicine and you want to do something else, it, you certainly have to, to accommodate that. You've certainly got to be amenable and you've got to be civil about it. Um, submissive, well, again, that's sort of like surrendering. I think that's where that came in. Subservient, well, I, I certainly hope that none of my patients at least are subservient to, to me, uh, but um, perhaps at times they may that way. You've also got to adapt. Uh, and again, your lifestyle is when you go on parental nutrition or enteral nutrition for that matter, any of these things, or even if you're just taking medications, uh, you've got to, uh, your lifestyle has to adapt uh, in order to uh, be able to take these. So for example, if you're taking a medicine once a day, well, that's that's pretty easy. If you're taking it twice a day, then the way I sort of look at it is, well, you brush your teeth twice a day, hopefully. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, it's easy to take a medicine twice a day. If you only brush your teeth once a day, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, and if, uh, if you brush your teeth twice a day, but you have a medicine that you need to take three times a day, then clearly you're going to need to adapt something in the middle of the day in order to uh, re remind, be able to remind yourself to take that medication. Compliance also has to be enduring because it's not something that you just do for a month. It's something that you may potentially have to do for the rest of your life. Uh, and that is accentuated when you respect this situation and you respect the potential complications uh, that can develop. And facilitation is, 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 is obviously part of all this. So the question that you should ask yourself is what words make you wanna be compliant? Well, some of these words uh, that I've uttered here uh, are not words that, um, that we like. Uh, and some of them are a little bit more accommodating, if you will, uh, to reuse a word in the, in the definition. So I'm sure that most people would be more compliant if they just simply had an agreement, if they were amenable to it, they could adapt to it, they could be accommodating, uh, and probably people are gonna be a little bit less compliant if there's a demand, if they've gotta be obedient, if they've gotta surrender, and they've gotta be submissive or, or, or subservient. So some of the issues of compliance have to do with how it's operationally defined and, and what your provider expects, what your family expects, and, and what you actually expect. Some of these terms, as I mentioned, will suggest a positive response and some of them not such a positive response, even a negative response. Next slide. So what factors influence compliance? Well, certainly forgetfulness. As I mentioned, if you have a medicine that's uh, three times a day, well, it's probably pretty easy to take it once a day or twice a day. Forgetting that uh, middle of the day dose is, is difficult, especially if you're working or you've got other uh, activities. Sometimes you just don't wanna remember. It. Uh, and so you intentionally disregard uh, this, um, the, the, the act of, of being compliant. Sometimes it's, it's not your fault at all. It's just that you really weren't taught right to start with. So for example, you, you're, you've come to the hospital 10 times in a year because your catheter keeps getting infected. Uh, well, maybe you're taking shortcuts. 
maybe no one actually really ever taught you how to take care of it appropriately. Um, I'm gonna have to look over here because my internet connection is getting a little weird. There it is, it's back again. There are also a lot of issues that are particular to particular individuals, such as, for example, how much do you know about your own health? How much do you know about your own health care? We, we call that health literacy, or at least I call it that. How much uh, support do you have? I think our last speaker talked about the tremendous family support uh, that, that she had. I heard the tail end of that, and that's extremely important. What kind of community support do you have if you live alone, for example? And also mental health uh, abilities uh, in terms of whether you have a, a mental uh, disorder that, that, help, that, that uh, helps prevent you from understanding or complying with the skills that you need to develop. The other thing, it's also extremely important here is, is you can have all the instruction in the world, but if you're just not engaged or you've been taught long and taught wrong, it's just not gonna work well. And so whether you self-care and, and uh, mix and, and infuse your own parental nutrition or you have a family member that helps, they've gotta be engaged with what they're doing. Uh, and and you, you can't be watching TV when you're cleaning your catheter. And if you drop your, you clean your catheter with, with a couple of chlorhexidines and you happen to drop it in the bed just for a microsecond, the five second rule does not apply to parental nutrition. You gotta start cleaning it over again. Next slide. So what are the consequences of non-compliance? Well, we know that obviously hospitalizations for infections are, are an important issue of this. And I, I work for, a, a besides a, at the University of Illinois, I also direct gastroenterology for Anthem Health, which may be the insurance company that many of you have. And one of the things that we're working on is to create um, a, an educational piece for our case managers who can give to, uh, to our members uh, tips on how to stay out of the hospital, how to take care of things at home, how to clean your catheter, how to go to the OLE site. Uh, because hospitalizations for infections are, are obviously expensive. They can be deadly to you. And when you come in the hospital for one reason, you may end up being there for another reason because there are nosocomial infections that, that obviously occur in the hospital. And we like to keep people out of the hospital so they avoid those. We wanna keep you out of the emergency room. We wanna keep you from being dehydrated. And, and one of the issues there is you've gotta do your parental nutrition or your enteral nutrition, because if you don't, you're gonna end up in pro with problems. For example, uh, you're doing your parental nutrition every other day, but nobody knows. And the pharmacist sees that, well, your potassium is always low. And so they put more potassium in the bag and they keep adding more and more and more. And then you come into the emergency room with a problem and you actually get the parental nutrition that you're supposed to get. And your potassium level is three times normal and you end up having a serious heart problem and die. So that's a good example. I've seen that sort of thing happen uh, where uh, it's a very serious consequence of noncompliance. Certainly malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition alone is a bad thing, but malnutrition contributes to a lot of other things, including increased risk for infections, uh, poor wound healing, uh, and poor wound healing if you have an operation. Uh, I've mentioned about some of the, ab the abnormal laboratory results, and we know that individuals that are on long-term parental nutrition have a risk of kidney damage. Uh, we originally described uh, many years ago uh, that um, some of this was related to drugs that had to be taken for to treat infections and, and that sort of thing. But a, a lot of it we couldn't figure out. And then there was a group from France that took our what we had found and they discovered that having normal blood tests, despite that, uh, despite a normal creatinine, for example, that their patients were developing a decline in kidney function. And this was actually related to chronic dehydration. Now we think, well, if you're dehydrated, you just you know drink a bunch of fluid or you get a bunch of IVs and everything's fine. And even if your kidneys have failed temporarily, they'll go back to normal. 
But the problem is, is that when you receive chronic, require chronic uh, intravenous or, or even enteral feeding, because you need fluid there as well, the, the kidneys don't heal themselves. And over time, uh, you can actually develop kidney failure. Now, refeeding syndrome is an interesting thing, and we actually still see this these days. This was originally described after, the, uh, wor after World War II when the Allies um, uh, liberated the, 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 the concentration camps, and they found uh, all the survivors who weighed 40 pounds um, were you know, five foot seven or whatever, and they were horribly malnourished. I'm, I'm sure most or many of you or all of you have seen uh, the pictures. And there was a rush to refeed these individuals rapidly because they were so malnourished. And, and what they did is they, they, they killed these individuals because the body adapts to starvation and it can't handle excess nutrients right away. It has to adapt. And so what happens is your potassium level goes really low and you can have a, an arrhythmia of the heart and have a heart attack basically, or your phosphate level goes really low because phosphate is needed for the body to make energy that it uses. And when the phosphate level goes really low, your muscles don't work right and your respiratory muscles don't work right. So you can't breathe uh, and you die. And we actually still see this uh, occasionally, sometimes in the hospital because doctors are afraid to use parental nutrition because they don't know how to even fill out the order form, let alone how to, how to management, manage it. Uh, and they don't give patients parental nutrition when they need it and they lose 20 pounds in the hospital. Uh, and then the, they can develop refeeding syndrome when they're refed. This can also happen at home when you're not doing your parental nutrition or you're doing it every other day when you're supposed to do it every day or every night um, and you've lost a lot of weight. And then there's a rush to, to get all this, um, uh, re-nourish you, get all the, all the weight back. The bottom line is, is all of this can actually re result in death, which is something that's uh, irreversible. Next slide. So what are some of the areas of concern that as a, a physician that I have, um, but, but, yeah, okay, um, where there can be non-compliance or, or non-adherence, which uh, I think can be used uh, interchangeably. Non-adherence would be basically not, um, not responding to directions that you're given. I mentioned uh, a little earlier on about catheter care, that you're too much in a hurry, uh, you drop the catheter on, 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 on the, bed, the blanket uh, just for a second before you pick it up. And well, unfortunately, you, you really have to start over again. You've gotta be really diligent about the catheter care. Alcohol is not sufficient, that only cleans off dirt. Uh, and it's, it's bacterial static, which means that it doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria, but it, it, it pre only prevents them from, from multiplying. You've got to use chlorhexidine, uh, and you've you, you've really got to you, you got to do this in a clean area. You can't get ready in the kitchen. You got to clean the table over. You got to take your time. Um, another issue is is that you've got to pay attention to when you have fever, when you're not feeling well. And so sometimes patients will say, "Well, I had a little fever when I was infusing, but oh, I felt fine as soon as I I uh, unhooked in the morning," and and then they don't want to do it the next night because. Uh, the, the parental nutrition makes them feel bad. Well, you got to call you got to call your doctor because that's probably a sign that you have a, a little nidus of infection at the tip of the catheter, and it's and the bacteria are only going into your bloodstream when you're infusing the parental nutrition. So the answer is not to do the parental nutrition. It's 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 to call your doctor uh, and get blood cultures drawn, possibly be on antibiotics. By the time you start having fever, when you're off of the parental nutrition then you could be heading to the ICU and have a serious problem. Um, I mentioned about uh, not infusing all of your parental nutrition, uh, maybe skipping some nights. And, and again, this is, this is not a good thing, especially over the long run. When you don't store your solutions, you don't refrigerate them correctly, um, you don't protect them from light when, when required, um, these can result in uh, degradation uh, of the solutions and, and you don't get the nutrition that you need. Some things have to be added to the parental nutrition. For example, the multivitamins. And it requires a little bit of um, uh, uh, action with your, your hands. And if you have arthritis, that can be a little bit challenging. 
but the answer is not to avoid adding the vitamins to the parental nutrition. The answer is to have somebody help you. Flushing the catheter, that's again important because you don't want to get a blood clot in the catheter. Each time the catheter has to be removed and replaced, even if it's in a different area, you've damaged that vein. And there's only so many catheters in so many places that, that can be uh, put before you, know, you end up uh, needing um, a, a potential uh, intestinal transplant. But you can't even get a transplant if you don't have uh, access, uh, venous access, because that's needed for the transplant as well. You've got to take your medications. Um, and, and, and I can tell you from my own personal uh, 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 you know, issues, uh, three years ago, I took no medications, not even a vitamin. Now I have to take five because I'm 61 years old. This is what happens. But if you don't take them, then you end up with problems. Oral rehydration solutions. I know many of you um, haven't tried these and, and some of you who have tried them don't like them. Well, it's, it's something that you have to work with, uh, add some flavor to them or whatever. This is critical to help you avoid dehydration and also critical to allow your providers to be able to decrease the volume of parental nutrition that you get, uh, perhaps decrease the number of days that you get it and decrease the number of hours that you get it. Um, my personal opinion is that nobody at home needs weekly blood tests because usually when that happens, your provider is, not, is ordering a new blood test before they've seen the results of the old one. You don't even need a monthly unless there's something being done like your parental nutrition is being weaned or there's changes being made. Uh, a stable patient uh, we see typically needs labs whenever we see them two or three times a year. But when, when important laboratory work is requested, you need to get it. If your provider is ordering blood tests every week uh, or every month, you need to ask them why uh, and, and see the results. If they're all normal, there's certainly no reason to, to uh, uh, repeat those. But, but if they're not, or there are changes being made, you do need to get the requested laboratory work. And then the big thing too is being a no-show in clinic. Not only does that screw up our schedule, but but the doctor can sometimes see things that you can't. And it's always good to, to, to show up for your appointments. And if you can't, uh, or you're in the hospital or what have you, notify uh, your doctor that, that you can't make it so that you can reschedule, because that's, that's important. And telemedicine actually has really helped this. And there's almost no excuse other than being sick in the hospital to miss even a, a telemedicine appointment. Next slide. So how do we improve compliance? Well, there's things that you can do and there's things that your providers can do. One of the things that, that it, your, your doctor should do is instructions that they give you, especially complicated ones, they need to write these down for you. And sometimes pictures are very useful or for example, a video of catheter care. Uh, and I think there's, well, there used to be one at least on the OLE site, um, uh, Joan and others can comment as to whether uh, we, we still have that information there. Um, and the other thing is actually, if you speak Mandarin, it really doesn't help to have the instructions in English. So you've got to, have, almost every hospital has various interpreters, uh, maybe not in every language, but in, but in most, um, you've, you've got to ask for uh, information in, in your uh, language. Because if, if, if you don't indicate that you don't understand, nobody's going to know. Um, if you're on a lot of different medications, your doctor hopefully will go over those with you and maybe streamline them a little bit and maybe some that you don't need to take or, or can they make them all twice a day instead of having some twice a day, some four times a day, some three times a day. A lot of times physicians don't really think about that and it's incumbent on you, uh, the consumer, to bring that up to the physician and say, hey, can we make this a little bit easier you know, for me? The same goes for the, the, the additives to parental nutrition. So for example, you're infected and you've got to add two antibiotics plus your proton pump inhibitor plus your, your multivitamin. The more things you add, the more likely there is to be contamination and the more likely you are to make a mistake. Uh, and so we want to try to limit the number of things to be added to the parental nutrition and what can be added by the home care company before they deliver it. We also want to minimize infusion time. I see a lot of patients in being infused over 12 to 14 hours plus um, their, their tapering period. Well, 
I, I infuse people over 10 hours. And sometimes we can get away with a young person with a good heart, maybe even over eight hours if they've you know, got to get to work. Um, and, and plus obviously the, the, the taper period, which can be as little as 30 minutes. It doesn't have to necessarily be a, a, a full hour. Uh, and so uh, the less time you're on parental nutrition, the more compliant you're probably going to be. Sometimes also we'll, we'll give a, a patient a day off, even if we know they're going to get a little bit dehydrated, but we know they're compliant, they're going to do it the next day, they'll drink their oral rehydration solutions, then it just gives you a chance to go out and go to a movie or, or something of, of that sort. Um, and telemedicine, of course, has been really a blessing here, uh, for, especially for people that live uh, far away, uh, or it's a hassle to, uh, to, to get into um, clinic. Uh, obviously, telemedicine, um, you can show uh, your catheter site uh, to your provider. Um, you can show your skin, but there is a difference of being in person uh, and actually having a, a full examination. But it's, it's still very useful, even for stomal problems, things of that sort. And finally, uh, something that's actually very important is weaning. Uh, parental or enteral therapy. Um, a lot of people get stuck on parental nutrition for an indefinite period of time because the doctor says, well, you know, they're not hungry. I can't reduce it. Well, you're not hungry because you're getting all your nutrients from parental nutrition and your brain, uh, the hypothalamus part of the brain doesn't sense hunger. And so when the residents ask me, well, how do you wean somebody from parental nutrition? The first thing I tell them is you got to press the down arrow on the, on the, on the pump. You know, we give everybody a little bit more uh, uh, parental and enteral nutrition than they need, because if you're out in the garden and it's 114 degrees, uh, you're going to get dehydrated. So we give you a little bit extra fluid. So you can reduce anybody's parental nutrition. You don't want to be getting exactly what you need. But if you want to try to wean yourself from parental nutrition, the first thing you've got to do is decrease it so that your appetite uh, can, uh, can increase. And we know also that the lipids that are in the parental nutrition, the fat emulsion, that delays the emptying of your stomach, which can cause what we call early satiety. Uh, so it makes you feel full. So you don't feel like eating. And we certainly don't want that. And I think that's the last slide I have. Um, uh, let, let go on and see if that, that's it. So I'm going to open up to um, any questions or, or discussions that, um, that, that people have. I think there's some in the, in the chat here. Let me see what, uh, what they are. Um, Ellen, I, I have a question. Um, I just wonder if you could talk just uh, just ever so briefly about the flexibility in the hours that you infuse. You know, I've gotten some calls about people feel they're missing uh, evening events with their kids in that because they went home thinking they needed to hook up every day at five o'clock because that's the, that was the schedule in the hospital. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me just answer one question that's in the chat first, before, so I don't forget about it. Um, and, and because it's a very common thing, um, the individual said they can't really tolerate the or, oral rehydration solution. And one of the things that that um, we found that makes it much more tolerable, besides adding adding flavor packets and so on, is to uh, either uh, refrigerate it so it's very cold, or you can also make uh, popsicles or or ice cubes. Uh, you know, from it. So when it's when it's really cold, it's great. In fact, my my 16 year old used to like just you know, drink. it's both like the popsicles, but they they actually drink it as a as a as a regular drink. Uh, but as long as it's cold, uh, I I tried it when it was warm, and they thought it was disgusting. So so that's that's my uh, that that's my thoughts on that. Now for for Joan's uh, question in terms of in, infusion time. You know, there's no magic here. Obviously, if somebody's got heart failure, um, we, we want to infuse a, a, a lower volume uh, as well as infuse it uh, more slowly. And if you do it on nutrition too fast, some people may develop muscle cramps because what happens is you're getting fluid shifts uh, between uh, the intra and extracellular compartments in and out of cells and the potassium and the magnesium will move in and out of cells. And so your potassium or magnesium levels could be uh, low in your blood sort of transiently during a rapid infusion and you get cramps. So those are people where we do uh, increase um, the duration of the, uh, in, in the infusion. But if that doesn't occur, then if somebody's getting infused over, I mean, I've seen people sent home 24 hour infusion. Like, are you kidding me? Jesus, I mean, you might as well stay in the hospital. 
I mean, what's the point of that? Um, but if, if say you're getting it over 14 hours, then we usually taper by two hour increments. So you just do the math. So whatever volume you're getting, it's infused over 14 hours. And, and, and remember that that volume, uh, the volume of the bag is 14 hours plus the, the, the taper. So we don't wanna include the taper in that calculation because then you don't end up getting everything. Uh, and, and there should be a little bit left in the bag. It shouldn't be totally running out, but you shouldn't have like, you know, 300 cc's left in the bag because then you're also not getting all the vitamins and electrolytes and stuff too. But in any case, uh, so if you're getting 14 hours a day, then the next step would be to go to 12 hours a day and you increase the rate in, in order to infuse that full volume now over 12 hours. And then if, uh, and, and we'll check a blood sugar, uh, usually two hours uh, into the uh, uh, infusion. And if that, if that blood sugar is you know, less 180 or less, then, then we know that um, we can, the next day we'll, or next night, we'll go to 10 hours. Um, eight hours is really probably the fastest in, in infusion uh, that I would do. Um, but again, it depends on the volume uh, that you're getting. Are you getting a one and a half liters? Are you getting three liters? Um, you know, are you getting three liters, which is the largest bags, um, plus um, uh, IV fluid before and after your parental nutrition? The IV fluid, of course, can be run in wide open. That doesn't even need to go through a pump uh, unless you can sit, get it on its highest setting at, you know, 999. Um, and, and infuse it, you know, more rapidly. Uh, but that, sh that should be able to go in, you know, really, uh, you know, really quickly. For those that have, you know, a high output um, tegenostomy, for example, that the amount of fluid provided with your parental nutrition is, is not um, sufficient by itself. Right, but you can choose at eight hours based on your schedule, correct? Oh, 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 you mean in terms of like when you start and when you yes. stop? Yes, oh yes. yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, there, if, you, if you work the night shift, you can infuse during the day, you yeah. know. And, and with the portable pumps, you know, I mean, depending on what your activity is, uh, I mean, you can, uh, you know, throw the solutions in a backpack, and they can infuse. Uh, you know, if if, if you got to come see me at eight o'clock in the morning, um, which is we usually try to avoid that, but if that's you know like the only opening or something, uh, you can infuse. You know, while you're driving or or or, or whatever it is. I mean. Yeah, I mean, the, the, these new small pumps, it's not like the big clunkers that, that um, you know, weighed 100 pounds and, and, and you, um, you know, needed to wheel them, you know, around with you, so. That's good, thanks. We have a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, oh, yeah. I'm one is, here, I see. Yeah, let me yeah so here. I've got the ones from the chat. One is, can you explain the mechanism of why um, some patients complain of nausea when they're on lipid uh, Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading this one here. Uh, um, so yeah, the, 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 there's an individual with uh, 13 centimeters of intestine. Obviously that's, that's, not, um, <laughs> that's not very much. Um, and so the, the issue in terms of eating and drinking is, and, and it's really, it, it doesn't matter how much intestine you have, we, we want you to kind of graze through the day. Um, and, and, and if you're in the hospital, for example, you need to explain this to, to dietary, for example, because otherwise they're gonna bring you three meals a day. But you really kind of need to be eating continuously. And you obviously want to avoid uh, foods that will uh, trigger um, excess uh, urination, for example, like caffeine containing products, uh, like you know Coca-Cola, coffee, you know things like that, because uh, not only uh, will you have um, diarrhea, but you'll also have, you know, more urination. And, and by the way, a good measure of the uh, of, uh, hydration, which is a little bit off the subject of this particular question, is your urine output. I mean, it's not one-to-one, -one, then you need more fluid. Um, and, and the average person really should put out about a liter of fluid a day. So if you're, if you collect your urine, and we, we often have patients do this, uh, they'll, they'll collect it. They don't have to keep it. They just collect it, measure it, throw it out. Um, but but if you're if you're putting out you know two thousand milliliters of, of pee a day, then you're getting too much IV fluid. You don't need that much, and you can cut back there. And if you're putting out eight hundred, you need more uh, because you're you're you dehydrated and and your kidneys are going to suffer you know over the you know over the long run. So, um, but in terms of the eating and, and, and drinking, then it's in there, she's, she's always hungry. Well, I think that's, that's good. I mean, you know, the, uh, hopefully, I mean, you're on uh, a bunch of anti-diarrheals, uh, loperamide, Imodium, 
um, maybe you know codeine uh, or a tincture of opium if 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 necessary to slow things down because nutrient and fluid absorption is a function of two things how much bowel you, well three things really how much bowel you have how healthy that bowel is and how long it spends there and, and so the antidiarrheals not only decrease your diarrhea but they they decrease the transit time. And so all your nutrients are going to spend more time uh, in your bowel. Um, so, uh, you know, so obviously, if, if you've only got 13 centimeters of, of intestine, I'm surprised you're able to do parental nutrition every other day. So it makes me suspect that you have more than 13 centimeters, uh, because physiologically, unless there's a stricture there, it really would be impossible um, uh, to, to uh, uh, have enough, have sufficient fluid and nutrients for every other day. But, but nevertheless, um, as long as you're hungry, I mean, that's your, that's your brain telling you eat. So, um, uh, absolutely. Is it okay to be eating so much? I mean, we want people to eat a minimum of one and a half times what they used to eat before they had their catastrophe. Uh, if you're eating two to three times, um, what you used to eat, that's, that's, totally fine. I mean, there's no more uh, buffets these days, uh, but once they come back, um, the, that's a perfect place for you until they tell you to leave because they can't afford to have you eat there anymore. Um, the, the eating is, that's a natural thing. It's much more natural than parental nutrition. The other thing is, is that when you infuse nutrients intravenously, the first place they go uh, is the right side of your heart and then the kidneys and then the liver they're not metabolized the same way as when you eat the same nutrients by mouth. And so some of my research, for example, in choline deficiency uh, is exactly, uh, the, the, the deficiency develops exactly because of that, because um, one of the amino acids that you get in, in the parental nutrition solution, methionine, well, when you infuse it as part of the parental nutrition, it's not broken down by the liver the same way as when you eat it in a meal and eat it in a steak. Uh, and, and the products don't end up being the same that your, that your liver would make. So eating is um, always encouraged. And, and the only situation where eating is discouraged is if you have a proximal jejunostomy and in some, uh, in, in some situations, you can actually put out more fluid from your ostomy than you actually take in. And it, only sometimes in those situations um, do we have people back off a little bit, but that's the only situation. We only have about five more minutes for questions. So um, there are a couple about lipids that you may not have seen because they're in the chat rather than Q&A. One is about the why some patients complain of nausea when they're having TPN with lipids. And the other is, um, elab please elaborate on why lipids may result in delayed gastric emptying. Okay. Well, they're, they're pretty much the same question. I mean, the, the reason that lipids may cause nausea is probably because they delay gastric emptying, although they may also have a, a central effect in the brain that's not clear. Um, and, and there also just may be some uh, idiosyncratic uh, response to, to some of the lipids where, where you know, people do get some nausea, but I think most of it is, is from uh, delaying the emptying uh, of the stomach. Why that occurs, um, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know if anybody does or, or if it's just me, but um, even uh, lipids by mouth delay gastric emptying. And so that was actually behind, um, I forget his name, um, uh, who, he was a guy that, uh, that developed this, uh, Atkins, that was behind the Atkins diet of, of high protein, because protein has, uh, like meat has, has fat in it, and it delays the emptying of your stomach. Uh, and it uh, and you feel full, so you stop eating and you don't need all the carbohydrates. That was what was behind that that theory. So, but exactly how the lipids, whether they're taken by mouth or by vein, uh, delay the emptying of the stomach, I, I don't know. Maybe we can fit one more in. Um, this one says I infuse sixteen mil six, one thousand six hundred milliliters oh, sixteen hundred milliliters over ten hours at night but it causes them to have to urinate frequently and disrupt sleep. Um, the person can infuse during the day. So uh, they skip a day or two over the weekend to get some sleep. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Any suggestions? 
Yeah, well, I mean, sleep is a problem. I mean, there, there's actually not a lot of information on this, even though we all know it's a problem. There's a Jim Scalapio from uh, when he was at Mayo Clinic in Florida uh, did a, um, a, a study on this. And, we, and, and, and so there is actually some objective data that sleep is clearly impaired. And probably the thing that impairs it the most these days, because the pumps are pretty quiet and the like, is getting up to have to pee. Um, and, and the problem is there is that you're getting basically 24 hours worth of fluid in the period that, you, uh, that you're infusing, um, and, and the body's not able to keep all of that at, 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 at one time. So what I would suggest is measuring how much urine you have in 24 hours, because if, you, if you're putting out 2,500 or 2,000 uh, milliliters, then you're getting too much fluid, and they can cut back on the parental nutrition. If you're only putting out uh, you know, a day, then your infusion time may actually need to be increased uh, so that um, you're not getting so much at one time and, and you're not getting up so many times to pee at night. Thanks. There was a study that was at Aspen too about sleep and study. So hopefully we'll have an article in the only newsletter about it soon. Dr. Bookman, I think that that's about all we have time for. I know we didn't get to all the questions um, and I'll invite Joan to join us again so she can introduce our next speaker. We're really grateful to have you join us, Dr. Buckman. Thanks very much. Have a great yes, day. Th thanks so much, Alan. And you're going to add in compliance with all the regulations, you're adding your board participation to your bios. I will S send me an email from when that was. Actually. Oh, I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> but you know, it, it's like being an astronaut, though, with Oli. So, I mean, you know, once once on the board, like always on the board, I mean, you can never get away from it. That's so. right. You lose the title, never the job. All right. Thanks so All much right. for everything. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>